Welcome to This Paranormal Life, the only podcast that's hosted by myself, Mr. Kit Greer, and Mr. Rory Pars, professional paranormal investigator, MD, PhD, all rolled into one. <laughs> On this podcast, every week we dissect a different paranormal claim or tale and find out if it's true or not using our deductive skills honed over, frankly, decades of paranormal research. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the great things about this podcast that we try and do, you know, there's a lot of podcasts out there, a yeah. lot of noise, yeah. and we like to cut through it because yeah. every week we get straight to the point. That's right. We start our podcast and we That's go straight right. to the point. We, we, like, so many of these podcasts, they just like to talk. They ramble. They talk. Oh, how was your weekend? Oh, I, you oh never guessed this ghost I saw yesterday. I did, I did see though. You like you were at the beach. Yeah, this, week? this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man, it was so nice. Nice. It was really, yeah, yeah. Really what was the weather like? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good. So yeah, uh, straight to the point is what we do every week. That's right. Well, this week, Rory, I've got a doozy for you. I know I say that every week, and frankly, my words are not worth a penny. <laughs> this week, I'm for real, okay? I don't know if you've heard anything or know anything about a little book called The Vertical Plane. I know actually nothing about this book. This book is... Contains information so mind-blowing, so mind-bending, so face-melting, that if true, it changes everything. The book was only printed for a short time in the UK, I think in 1989, and it's extremely rare today. It's worryingly close. Second-hand copies regularly sell for hundreds of dollars. I think at the time of speaking, there's one copy available on Amazon UK for £600. This podcast does not make that kind of money. No. As such, I have not read the book. <laughs> But luckily, this. <laughs> luckily, small pockets of intrepid explorers of the paranormal have documented this book online and discuss it in forums to this day. It all begins in autumn 1984. We're in England, near the border of Wales in a small town called Doddleston. And the author, Ken Webster, is living in a cottage with his friend Debbie and their friend Nicola. Okay. One day, Nicola needs to write something up. You know, we've all been there. You need to write up a letter, CV, screenplay, what have you. The only problem is it's 1984. You don't just open up your Whackbook Pro and send it by Bluetooth to your 3D printer. Computers in 1984, shitty as hell. Right, obviously. Uh, just how shitty, you ask? I actually had to look this up. Uh, <laughs> how shitty were computers in olden days? Very. The whole concept of using a mouse to click on things it hadn't been invented until the year 1984 yeah yeah so nicola needed to type something up um no one really had computers back then but luckily ken the author of this story he was a school teacher at this time and he said no worries nicola we've got a bunch of these new bbc micros at the school i'll borrow one for a while type up your stuff nice so he took it out, set it up in the kitchen, and before long, Nicholas smashing out scripts left, right, and center. <clears throat> well, one day, they fire up the BBC Micro, and before they can boot the word processor, there's this text. The formatting is all off, and there are capital letters in all the wrong places, but he can still just about read it. True are the nightmares of a person that fears safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn pretty flower, turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow. But the flower reaches too high and withers in the burning light. Get out, you bricks. Pussycat, pussycat, went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your redeemer. What? That's good, right? That was in the file. Yeah. And he has no idea who wrote that. Nope. He just like took this new computer, took it back. From who? Excuse. Who, who did he take the computer from? Uh, <clears throat> he took this from the school. But I want to make clear, this isn't the first time he's used the computer. He's taken it home at this point. Okay. And he knew there was nothing on it. Oh. Set up in the kitchen. There's a new file on it. That's what's inside. Okay, so it wasn't the madman who gave him the computer. <laughs> Hopefully not. But we don't know yet. We just don't know anything yet. Like, the way you just read it is, I guess, I can read it. Okay. First thoughts. You think I'm Ken? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Debbie, for sure. <laughs> First thoughts. Man, what? Like, what? what? Usually, you know, these paranormal stories have the grounds in something else, mm. but this is something I've never seen before. Tech-mediated weirdness. But is it beyond the realms of possibility that someone else just went onto the computer and typed out a bunch of stuff? Maybe this was right. pranking in 1980s. Exactly. I don't know. 
kind of weird that it's like poetry, but like, yeah, totally. Someone could have just lifted that from that a, was someone a like book. I think whoever he lives with got back drunk that night mm. and was like maybe just like broken up with his girlfriend or something. <laughs> it's just like you think I don't? I'm not emotional enough. I'm emotional enough. <laughs> you girl i'm gonna be emotional right now oh pussycat pussycat <laughs> flowers to the sun baby blah 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 baby. i love you redeemer the <laughs> end because, and then because? He calls it, oh actually they should know that i don't mean this i'll call the file kidding oh it's too long uh, K- <laughs> kdn uh, he'll know everyone will know uh good night uh yeah <laughs> Yeah, because the capital letters are in all the wrong places, it does look like, like a, a drunk, drunk guy trying to write a love poem. <laughs> That's given it a whole new flavor, I have to say. Ken discovers this poem. What the f***? Who wrote it? Ken talks to the guys, um, Deb and Nick, and they they work out between them it wasn't them. Of course they would say that, but they, they decide it wasn't them. The computer has been sitting there all night, and not to mention this is pre-internet, so there's no physical way of transferring information to that computer. That's a good point. What about floppy D's? Yeah, it does take a floppy D. Yeah, definitely possible. Well, a few days pass, but one afternoon, Nicola boots up the micro once more, and right away she sees a new file. It's in English, but it's old English, like pre-Shakespeare stuff. I write on behalf of many what strange words thou speak. Thou art goodly man who hath fanciful woman who dwell in mine home with lights which devil maketh. Twas a great crime to hath bribed mine house. L.W. Oh, that's it? <laughs> that's it. No, it is actually uh, longer than that. He was kind of curious and he wanted someone's opinion on it. So he took a print of this to his friend Peter, who worked at a local university. <laughs> Peter yes. L.W. Smith. <laughs> He didn't really connect A good with friend us. of his, great with computers and lock picking. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you've said that, Peter was an expert in Old English. Oh, here we go. <laughs> of course he was. Uh, and early modern English, which I didn't realize, but are two different things. Um, I guess Ken thought he would find it interesting or at least funny. So he thought he'd run it by him. But when he hands this text to Peter, his face is sullen. He wants to know where... he thinks he's been caught. That's why. <laughs> Have you told anyone about it? <laughs> Uh, so he's an expert in these old dialects of, of English. And he wants to know where Ken's got this stuff from. Not only that, but he wants to take it home and study it. Cut to next time Ken sees Peter, and he he's freaked out, man. He says, this stuff is period correct. If someone's playing a prank in you, they're a scholarly prankster. Ken, Nick, and Debbie didn't know what to make of it. But for fun, what Ken does is he gets his friend to draft a reply to this mysterious message in the kind of rough language they might understand. So like, don't use any like slang, like modern slang, just like play their little game. Yeah. Like use that kind of language. Go hardcore. And their translation, you know, it, it worked out something like, you know, just basic questions. Like, thank you for the, for the message. Uh, sorry for disturbing you. Uh, what do you want us to do? Uh, did you live here? Thank you for not making us afraid. There's a few other questions. They're really going into it. Like, yeah. they're buying... Okay, they're going into yeah, it. Yeah, they're just like, they're like for the don't sake of... don't stop touching our computer. Yeah, because I mean... It, stranger. I think a lot of people would have gone like, F*** you, never come back. I'm going to shoot you. And by this time, Ken had had the bright idea to try and catch the hoaxer in the act. So it's kind of oh, clever. Yeah. Like, set a little trap of a reply, um, but try and catch them. So this meant borrowing another computer, checking the disk for preloaded material before, make sure it was wiped clean, checking the house was secure, and then leaving the computer in the kitchen as before. Doors locked, all the rest of it. What's the trap? We just did a bunch of things. Hmm? It's like, they were going to trap him. So they put the computer on the table. <laughs> They closed all the doors and they went to bed. Like, what is what? It's not so much a trap as a honey trap without the trap. It's just honey. Just honey. Here's a free computer to mess with. They're just trying to eliminate some of the doubt here. Okay, so use a new computer. Use a new computer. Right. In case it was the weird curse computer. So they leave the room for a while and do their thing, but it's not long until they check back. Maybe a couple hours. There's already another file. It reads... And this is the translation. It is helpful to hear of your time. The king is Henry VIII. Mine charge house is a place of law, of schooling. I must need say, how is it there are many things of which I have no knowledge? If you cannot say why you're in my house, then I can no more help you than if my wits had gone. 28th March 1521. Ooh. So it gives, gives them a date. Yeah. So it's as if this person is leaving messages from the past 
that are appearing on this computer in the present. Exactly, dude. Oh, some kind of intertime dimensional thing going on. So this might be the next logical step that they do, but so stop me if this is where we're headed next. Okay. But do they know about the origin of their house or the location that they're based in? Because, you know, if this was a town where, you know, there was a surrounding castle or old village, or maybe it had been built on land previously mm -hmm. used mm -hmm. in this farm, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. then that would make a little bit of sense, right? Yeah, there is definitely an obvious way of testing the veracity of these claims. Okay. And do not worry, we will get there. So LW starts revealing more, more about his life. <clears throat> he writes in one message, The writing machine is a wonderful thing. Somewhat unnatural, I fancy. Unknown to myself it may be. I have seen you make lights on the box, and I'm cunning. <clears throat> Your merrymaking is loud, but it pleases me. But there is not enough trust. I know not whence you came, nor whether you will go. And this freaks the guys out because Lucas isn't just communicating with them, but this means he can see them. He's seen their computer, the like box with lights. Well, how was he talking to them? We don't know yet. Oh, damn. That's I know. Weird. But the important thing is that as far as he's concerned, they're in his house. And he signs off this message, Lucas Wayneman. Is that a real person? They try to check the town records, like you say, but of course the problem is that even if they find a name, that just means that someone else could have looked that name up. If someone was really going to these lengths of speaking like correct old English, oh right, they could just find names, a, na a random they just name, find yeah. any name, you know, any. That's a really person. good point, actually. Um, but as it happens, they actually don't find the name Lucas Wayne Wayneman. Well, they keep going back and forth and getting his messages translated, and Ken is trying to explain more and more information about the modern world. Ken sort of thinks, all right, he's seen us. And he's like seen us hang out in this room and he's seen me type on this thing. So let's test it. He leaves a photo of a car right. beside the computer. And then hours later, the photo's gone and there's a reply inside. What kind of wood is this? <laughs> it's like silk. And they realize it's because he's never seen a photograph before. So like that kind of plasticky paper. Oh, not even have. the car. Not the car. I thought he was talking about the car. Not even getting started on the car. Yeah. That's way too crazy. <laughs> I think he does make some comment about the car. He's kind of like, where are the horses or something like right, that. Right, right. Whilst anyone could be sending fake messages from the past, they are sending and receiving messages too fast for someone to be breaking and entering the home every time. They've kind of ruled that out. Okay. That someone's literally running in and doing it and then running away again. That doesn't really make sense anymore. Peter, you know, he's working on the, on the old English and stuff. He says, I think there were two instances of words that came from the 1600s, not the 1500s. He said dope and lit in two <laughs> of the emails. What, what we're saying here is this is an unbelievable level of consistency. What they don't expect to happen is it's Lucas who snaps first. He says, why do you tell such lies? If you were alive, you would know that no such college exists. Why do you speak of a power of which I have no knowledge? That's when they were talking about electricity. Right. It is you who makes me afraid. And Ken and co realize, holy shit, this time we thought we were being hoaxed. Lucas thinks he's being hoaxed too. <clears throat> if we think about this, if it were a hoax, he would be telling them these lies and trying to get away with it. But rather Lucas is like, what the hell? Like you guys are claiming to be from the same place I'm from and you don't know any of these places. You're just going along with it. Okay, so here's where I draw issue with this. Please. So I'm assuming <laughs> that Lucas is looking through some sort of wormhole in his living room and he's like i don't know if i believe you guys and you're not just trolling me unless, unless the way he's responding is like i don't know writing it on a piece of parchment and putting it in a drawer and then the letter disappears like sending up the fireplace to yeah Santa Claus something, something. something yeah. like that unless he's doing that then i don't know how he thinks he's being tricked i guess the reason he is so convinced is because in these visions, however those are taking place, he's seen those guys in his house. Okay. In one of these messages, Lucas writes that he's seen Debbie in his own home. Ken reads this and doesn't know what he means right away. But Debbie says, she said she dreamed she was in an old English house hundreds of years ago. She didn't really think much of it, but she dreamed she walked through this house and was confronted by an old timey man Ooh. before she snapped awake. She thought the messages were just getting to her and it was kind of seeping into her subconscious. Right, that's what I'm thinking. But Lucas claims to have been visited by her. Mm. All throughout this time, the house is experiencing weird physical activity. One day, Ken and Debbie enter the house 
and there's chalk all over the walls. It's starting to like get out of control. There's chalk all over the walls in loopy patterns and they realize that it's handwriting, like old timey handwriting. And it's signed off at the end, Lucas. Has Lewis written this in his house and it's appeared in the modern day Lucas, house? Yeah, yeah, possibly. Lucas, sorry. So between the photo disappearing, Debbie visiting Lucas in the dream world and these chalk drawings, it's like the two worlds are linked in some way or the veil that separates the two different timelines or dimensions is thinning somehow. Okay. Well, the same day they receive a message to the BBC Micro, but it's different, this time from an entirely new messenger. My good man, I have heard of your griffins, lions and wondrous possessions and it is too fantastic to understand and your people are unnatural, but I have no dread. You are a phantasm of great powers. I feel as though you are in the future. I ask, when this king ends his reign, who will be the next king? I will not give you my name, nor Lucas's true description and name. Signed, a friend. So Lucas isn't even his real name. That, God damn, that little dastardly slimy worm. dog. The worm with that the worm silky hole. silky worm. <laughs> What's he trying to hide? The next morning, Debbie wakes and complains of a, another weird dream. She's back in what must be Lucas's house, and he's there with what looks like his wife, but they're arguing because Lucas can see Debbie, but his wife thinks that he's lost his mind. She's just seeing an empty room, and he's like, look, it's Debbie, and he's obviously just talking to like a blank wall or yeah. whatever. Well, to Debbie, it was only a dream, but the repercussions were greater than they thought. The next message they received on the micro was from Lucas's friend once more. You foolish scoundrel, you've brought ruin to my friend. I guarantee your death by my own name. Your charm of light is to be avoided because now he sits in a shameful dungeon. Ooh. It turns out that word had gotten out in the 1500s about Lucas's communication with the future. And back then, it wasn't good news. <laughs> People thought you were a witch or something, of course. you know? And so basically they threw him in a slammer. Lucas is being detained in his house at this point and he sends a message to Ken, Deb and Nicola. He says, I know not who betrayed me and accused me of witchcraft, but I know that you are my true friends. What can be done? I cannot take your hand before sentence of death. I must hear your words before I bid farewell. You said your people's time is 1985. I thought your time was also 2109. Like your friend who brought the box of lights to me. No, 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 no. This is where I stop. I'm off. No, he doesn't He doesn't mention this after 18 months <laughs> of contact. I mean, I think the idea is he doesn't... I think he didn't know they were from 1985. Or he forgot. <laughs> he I forgot! Know. I don't know. He forgot when a wizard from the future shows up and hands him a computer? <laughs> Uh, also, no, he he, rem a... he remembers that bit. He doesn't remember when these guys are from. They, no, this is this is insane. Because <laughs> what? So now he has he's he's been given a magic box from the future that I assume is a computer that can communicate with computers <clears throat> from his future. Sure. Then he gets a photograph and he's like, "What wooden silk is this?" He can't. He's baffled by that. He's got a computer. He's got a future box. This is a good time. He's got technology that we don't have now. Yeah. It was something I was going to get to later. But to quell your disbelief, sir, at this point, I would say Lucas in the 1500s is not going to be able to type on a QWERTY keyboard. Of course. I believe <clears throat> the way that it works for him is a bit like the way that Debbie dreams and sees Lucas's world. Right. Lucas either sees it in a dream or in some sort of altered state. The way okay. he experiences it is that he's speaking these messages. Oh, because it's his, in his old them. English native tongue, sort of. Yes, so he's not like literally like typing it out. Like, what did they? What did he? Be, what was he given from the future? I don't know, man. We don't know that. Okay. Okay. But Ken needed to get to the bottom of this. He thought to himself, "It's worth a shot." He grabbed the keyboard and started typing a command on the BBC Micro. Hack time. <laughs> Not far off. <gasps> Calling 2109, question mark. What is that? I mean, he knows the computer has no online capabilities. <laughs> what does he think is going to happen? No, just tell me. Please just tell me. You'll have to find out next week. Oh, no!